Mitch. Good luck. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so I was asked several times to do another talk about databases, but meanwhile the AI revolution has happened. So apparently I need to talk about AI now, but I would like to start with something else. Uh, there used to be this fascinating article uh, on the internet like 10 years ago. It was called uh, Falsehood Programmers Believe About Time. And this was uh, basically a list of the things that programmers believe that are untrue. Some of them are like very simple, like there are always 24 hours in a day. No, they aren't. And months have either 30 or 31 days. It's, it's trivial, but some of them are more fascinating, like um, uh, we had this, um, um, the system clock will always be set to the correct local time, which isn't true. And the time will never change on production, which apparently it will, even if the program is already running. And this is this spawned like a series of articles. They are collected in this re GitHub repository, Awesome Falsehoods. There are different ones, and um, for example, there is one about email. Email always have only one at symbol. No, it doesn't. It might have multiple. So, I would like to start a list of falsehoods, falsehood we believe about large language models. And the first one is they can chat. Yeah, I'm going to prove that they can't really chat at all. They can think. This one was proved recently that they can't really think and reason. And by think, I mean reason. And they can interact with things, which is also untrue. But let's first define what they really are. This is a Fibonacci sequence. So what large language model is doing it is basically trying to find some context. In this case, it will be like two last numbers. And guess what's the next one based on probability? So tokens. Um, tokens, there is this tool by OpenAI, which will allow you to input text. And you will get how does large language model see this text. So it will divide it into tokens. Tokens are like a little part that the large language model is trying to predict. and. Uh, they are not all the same. Like, for example, hello, it's a very popular word in English. It, it's very uh, widespread across a variety of texts, so it will be one token. Apparently, chat with the space at the beginning is something popular. GPT, um, um, the comma is separate token. Can you show me your tokens? Yes. Uh, all of those words are basically tokens. But if you do like Polish language, which isn't as popular, suddenly it's a very different story. <laughs> This sentence is used to demonstrate all the special characters in Polish language. And uh, yes, you can see like, uh, o, uh, u, where show up sometimes in a body of text uh, as well. But uh, like z or j are the letters that are not as popular as a part of something. So there will be separate tokens for them. And if you go like Asian languages, this sentence means uh, Nihongo Jozu des, which means you speak very good Japanese. And this is what you hear when you don't speak good Japanese from Japanese people. They will say Nihongo Jozu, and you're supposed to, yeah, I know I don't speak good Japanese. But um, the word Nihon, which is Japan, is one token. It's a popular word in Japanese, at least. Uh, Go, it means language. So basically, this is something that is like one word in one kanji character. This is like a very popular thing because it ends most of the sentences. And as you can see, there are only five, seven characters, but five tokens. So going back to our example, the large language model might find that 21 actually fits the thing because of the probability that it appears in the body of text. But it might guess blue. And by the way, blue is not one token. It's our two tokens. So, uh, well, but the, um, Exclamation mark is another token. So basically, it might guess any number of tokens that are matching the previous ones. So not all tokens are created equal. A lot of them include space at the beginning, because sentences include spaces, at least in European or American languages. Um, the more exotic the characters, the shorter the token, because they are like low probability token. So a large language model is basically something like a token factory. And uh, you can visualize it a little bit when you try the following prompt. Here is the prompt. Yes, it's, it's empty. Um, the token factory are designed to add the matching token, and the original of breaking them 
was to add, a, well, give them no token or give them something that doesn't have any signal, like a, And they will start spewing out nonsense because there is nothing to add the token to. But nowadays, if you use like GPT-40 and you type AAA, which is like a fascinating string of characters with absolutely no signal, you will get a very reasonable response. And the reason is that there is a lot of prompt processing going on. The language, large language models aren't really designed to handle this case. So there is a lot of software around them to make them feasible for this use case. There is a lot of processing. And the first one is there's actually no chat in a large language model. There are only stop tokens. Who has used a stop token setting in any kind of large language model, any kind of inference engine? Okay, uh, so this is going to be fun. This is what's called initial prompt. Initial prompt is something that you give, like a hidden part of the prompt that happens at the very beginning of a chat with a large language model. And this basically defines a chat. So you are a helpful chat assistant, user will ask questions, you will respond, prefix your responses with this, user will start with this. And here is an example, because examples work really well with large language models. Can you tell me who's the current president of the United States? And for at least some time, Joe Biden is the current president of the United States. Out of example, now the uh, answer user queries. And what we need to do is we actually need to prefix it with this because the user will type the rest. Okay, that's pretty cool. So what will happen is the chat will generate, first of all, it will generate the chat part, then we'll give 42 and it will get, generate another prompt called user. And this part here is a stop token. This, if it, if it generates user and um, um, this sign, it will stop generating tokens. The engine that runs the model will know that, okay, I found those tokens, I should stop at this point. Yeah, so stop tokens detected, stop generating tokens. That's how a large language model knows that it's supposed to stop. But it can fail. It can generate something that is slightly different and miss the stop tokens. So it will ask itself another question because it's supposed to be a chat. So it thinks that there's user's time and we need to add more tokens. It's funny. It's really funny uh, when we miss those stop tokens because the chat will talk to itself. And it's slightly less funny if you're using something like a voice, uh, out on uh, the voice um, GPT, like the one that um, advanced voice, um, what is called? Advanced voice, voice mode. Because what will happen is GPT will miss the stop token and it will emulate your own voice and ask itself another question. And this happens. This is from documentation on ChatGPT. And this is like a creepy po a post from um, ChatGPT Reddit. So if you miss the stop token in GPT-40 advanced voice mode, it will actually ask another question using your own voice. Very creepy. It happens. Also, the reverse is true. If the answer contains a stop token in the middle, and it will just drop the rest of the response because we hit the stop token. We should stop talking. This is a little bit fascinating, but also very creepy. It happens. And by the way, user, like those tokens, because there's not, not the one word, like there are at least two or three tokens here, are terrible stop tokens because it's very easy to hit them. So normally you use something like end of text, which is I think the default for Llama CPP, two new lines, or whatever you think that won't com come up naturally in the response that the large language model is generating. Yeah, going back to those falsehoods, we can also talk a little bit about that there is no thinking. And by the way, Apple uh, did some research like last month about this. They proved that uh, there is no reasoning happening because they changed the questions slightly, like added irrelevant information, and suddenly the quality of responses drop a lot um, for popular problems. But um, if you go to uh, GPT-10, which is the one that is like reasoning engine, thinking, and magical things, and ask it a question, you will get thinking, but there is no thinking. It's generating tokens. It does, just doesn't show you those tokens. Everything that happens in those models has to be written down in tokens. Otherwise, 
They just don't know anything. There is no hidden thinking, there is no memory, there are just tokens. Everything that is taken into consideration to generate output has been put in, put in as a token. Um, there are also this thing about tooling, like agents are becoming really popular, like GPTs that are doing stuff for us, but large language models cannot use tools. They just can generate tokens, that's basically it. They cannot use anything by themselves. But we can hack them to do all of those things. Start by abusing stop tokens. Imagine this scenario that we have, again, this prompt about chat. But this time, we tell them that there are three roles. There is assistant, there is user, and there's also tool. And we tell it that you can call this tool if you use a very specific syntax. And the end of the call to this tool, we define as a stop token. Here is an example. So you are a chat assistant that can call open weather magical API, that can predict weather for a given location at a given time. The following is chat between you, assistant, and user. Each of you start a part with assistant and user. But additionally, you can ask a tool to fetch the data by writing tool and give it in parameters in JSON format. And this important part, at commit at the end of the tool call. Here is an example invocation. We give it an example invocation. Chat start here. Go. OK. So we have two stop tokens here. We have user. If we stumble upon user, stop generating content. And we have commit. If you stumble upon commit, stop generating content. So what happens here is um, there is user's prompt. What was the weather in Poznan on 10th of May 2022? The chat generates this part. City Poznan, date this. Then we stop generating tokens. And we can detect that this thing was hit. So we write our own code that will take the rest of the response, parse it, and return the tokens. Well, not tokens, but return the string that gets appended into the entire thing. And then we call um, the large language model again and give it basically starting this. And the um, large language model pick up from this and says whatever is once and hit another stop token at the end. So you, of course, have to format it for the end user. You can't really show this part to the, someone who's talking to a chat that there is like a function call and there is like a function response. So you basically parse this output, and you get this nice thing, which is really nice. And this is like, it's really happening. This is part of a long chain that was already mentioned. And this basically parses part of um, um, something that was already JSON, I think, because they already parsed um, part of the response. But they do like function name, they split it, they try to figure out what was the function, then they call the function, um, they parse the arguments, they call the function, and then return the string and put it back into LLM to continue. So that's, that's how it works. That's how they use tools. Basically, you tell them, if you stumble upon that you need a tool, just call this, and we define a stop token that will make it stop working, and then we pick it from there and give it back to LLM. What else we can do? Like, we decided that it has no memory. And uh, Pavel will talk a little bit more about this, but I want to like at least uh, uh, scratch the surface on embeddings. What are embeddings? Um, embeddings are representing a concept, something that the large language model is interested in, as a vector. And vector is basically an array of floats, so nothing fancy. They are great for indexing unstructured data. They are a little bit unpredictable. Proceed with caution. But um, here is an example sentence, two black cats with blue eyes. And if you like parse it into large language model, it might decide that there is a high level of catness into this sentence. There is a little bit of blackness. Um, maybe there is a two-ness, which is like having two of something. And there is like high blue-eyedness, because it decided that this is a concept. You don't have to define them. The role of the model is to extract it from the text and put it as a vector. So another example, we have like a, this thing. Yeah, it was really weird because I like queen and queen on, on, um, on a car. Um, so king to a queen and king to a car. King, as a concept, has high royalness. Queen has also high royalness. But car isn't really like a royal person, so it has low royalness. Let's change the concept. King has high manliness. Queen, unless you decide not to, has low manliness. 
And car is also not very um, man, so it has low manliness. So if we like compare the distances for those concepts between those entities, king has a closer distance to queen, longer distance to car. Queen has a, a, a closer distance to uh, queen and longer distance to car. And car has a shorter distance to queen and very long to king. Here is like an example that um, here is the manliness scale and here is the royalness scale. King is here because it has a high both. Queen is here. Car is here. So you can see that this distance are well on this particular axis. Like it's a little bit stretch, but you can trust me that this is basically the same. But this is like um, but from from a triangular rule um, a little bit longer. So we can find concepts that are similar. And that's in basically the entirety of RAG. We want to supply the data. We want to do a lookup, like chat. Um, the language model will generate us some text, and we find some text that is similar in the database. We can either put it into the initial prompt, or we can add a tool that will add this uh, text a little bit later. And um, as uh, was already mentioned, we have a lot of vector databases which are specializing in uh, keeping this stuff in the database, so we can use um, something that will uh, find it quickly. Um, there was an example of PG Vector, but also like Elasticsearch in the newest search kick, there is an option to use um, nearest neighbor search, which is like a find the nearest items in a vector space. So yeah, you can basically have a lot of data, vectorize it, save it to database, and when you need to find some concept similar to a free text, it will find the similar concept. So you can put it into either the prompt or a tool for an LLM. This is called vector search. Um, try it on your own data, especially if you have like a lots of like a big blobs of unstructured text. Perhaps you have PDFs with uh, some company information. Perhaps you have something like uh, scraped data from the internet. This works really, really well. Um, it can add a memory to an LLM because we decided that LLM has no memory. It has to have tokens. But if we are to look up something in the database, suddenly we do have some kind of memory. And uh, I'll cover this uh, when I'm next talking about the database again, uh, hopefully soon. But all this putting data into LLM, and uh, still we need for the LLM to also be able to give us a result that we can actually use in templates, in serializers, in formatters, because otherwise we just get a string of text, and that's not something helpful for parsing and, and playing with our object-oriented or functional programming world. So getting the format right is also very important. So models can only generate tokens, and they do not play, a string of tokens doesn't really play nicely with our code, but JSON does, and JSON is basically text. There is this very specific algorithm that we can use to get a structured format like JSON from a large language model. And uh, it's something like this. Ask the model to match the output with a JSON schema. When the model returns your response, verify if the JSON schema, uh, the, the response is actually right against JSON schema. And if it doesn't, send it back to LLM to fix it, which is apparently the same thing as we do with junior developers' pull requests. Like, Ask them to implement something, verify, and if they're wrong, tell them to do it again. Yeah, so we treat them as junior developers. Here is a pseudocode, please don't copy it, for doing exactly this. So response, LLM prompt, JSON schema and prompt. If it doesn't work, LLM fix response. And again, same JSON schema and the response that it provided. This is an actual code, again, from Langchain that does this. It's kind of creepy to look at the large body of text in the middle of the function, right? It's like super weird. Um, this will um, just include JSON schema, and then and it will include your particular instructions at the end. And also, there is this another prompt. Uh, by the way, Langchain is super inconsistent. Some of the prompts are in methods. Some of them are in YAML templates. There is like everything and nothing. It, it looks like it was like held together with like a ball of glue or something, but it works. So this is the fixed, um, fixed um, query 
which is basically taking the previous instructions, previous response, uh, saying what's the error in JSON schema, and asking it nicely to, to, to fix it. Yeah, so Langstring has like a bunch of those different things. Um, I treat it as a ORM for lang lang large language models, like ORM for database and Langchain for LLMs. It works well and provides also a layer of abstractions for very different LLMs, so we can use other ones. And uh, includes most of those algorithms, like there is RAG, there is um, uh, output, structured output. Uh, there are also called like alter alternatives, like this one was got really popular for some time. It's called GPT script, in which you write this special language called GPT script, and you can integrate it with your other application. It also has a nice CLI to debug. Uh, of course, if you use something like OpenAI, they already have most of this abstraction written, and you get a nice API. Like there is structured output, there is um, creating embeddings, there is there is a lot of different stuff, but it's really expensive because you're paying them not only to use their model, but also paying them for all the abstractions they have written. And there are way, way too many uh, GUI and CLI tools to list. <coughs> but that's the fun part. It's wild west out there. A lot of this stuff is still in flux. You can write your own. There is a lot of stuff to build. Like we have this Magicum token generator, which is the model itself. But we have like knowledge databases, output parsers, formatters, tool runners, prompt builders, and templating engines. Like there's like a bunch of different stuff for us programmers to do around this new magical token generator. It feels like if the, we had like uh, the same moment that the databases first got popular, we have this new tool, and suddenly we have to build, build all the fun part around it. So, if you have any questions, let me quickly generate a response and. Uh, Oh, I missed this top token. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Any Q and A? I didn't get what is rack about. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's yeah, you get. I, I didn't want to go very deep into it because there is a whole presentation about this. Oh, yeah. But basically, it's a way of injecting extra knowledge into LLM taken from outside. Like if you have a chatbot and you're working like, oh, uh, Allegro has a great example. They built a model themselves, they're hosting it themselves, and the model has an access to look up the stuff from the Allegro terms of service. So if you do a chat with that particular bot, it will chat to you in the context of what Allegro allows and not allows to do on their platform. Any other questions? Sorry, not reasoning. Yeah. Um, because it basically, let me quickly go to that. Uh, it's a very long way from here, but we'll manage. Um, yes. So when I said that uh, O1 cannot think, is because you're basically seeing this while it's working, right? If you try to like run it right now and you pick O1, you will see this thinking. But what is actually happening is they, they have this extra hidden <coughs> prompt that says um, elaborate, uh, clarify the request and then write the plan on what you're trying to do. So it's not reasoning, it's still pattern matching, but the pattern matches against its own response. That's not reasoning because if you, for example, add some extra information, this will be lost. They already generated it. Yes. They they call this um, like if you look like the those prompt engineering patterns like very loud word, but th this basically means this is called a chain of thought, and it's about the same as telling ChatGPT, uh, please write the steps of what you're trying to do before you write the response. It will give you much better responses because it gives it a little bit of space to uh, create the memory that they can uh, use to generate the future tokens. But they did two things. First of all, they hidden the chain of thought part, so you don't see it, you only see thinking. And by the way, they bill you for it. You can see those thinking tokens, which is fun. And the second thing is they fine-tune the models 
for exactly those type of queries, which gives them a little bit of a better result. Any other question? Nothing. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>